It's Friday, September the 20th. From The Economist in London, this is The Week Ahead, a look at some of the stories that will be in the headlines next week. I'm Daniel Franklin, Executive Editor at The Economist. And I'm Tom Wainwright, the homepage editor. In The Week Ahead, Germany holds a federal election, Barack Obama and Hassan Rouhani cross paths in New York, world leaders discuss new Millennium Development Goals, and a new painting by Vincent van Gogh goes on display in Amsterdam. Daniel, on Sunday, Germany is holding its federal election. The obvious question, who's going to win? Well, I think the answer to that is, is uh, basic answer to that is fairly clear. Angela Merkel is going to win. Her party is well ahead in the polls. Uh, but if you look below that um, and you ask, well, who's she going to be governing with, then the question becomes trickier. And it's really in the finer details of the election that this vote will become uh, very interesting. Uh, but I think almost inevitably Angela Merkel will remain what she has been for uh, recent years, the most powerful woman politician in Europe and the key person that people will look to to sort out the ongoing mess of, uh, of the Euro crisis. What kind of combinations could we end up with then? Well, there could be a continuation of the current coalition which, in which uh, Angela Merkel's uh, centre-right party leads with the uh, liberals of the Free Democrats and there's always a question in German elections of whether the the FDP, the Liberal Party, gets over the 5% threshold that you need to win seats in the German Parliament. Um, it, it always seems to manage it at the end. Uh, its vote tends to be slightly higher than it, than it, it gets in opinion polls in advance. Uh, it's likely to do so again, but whether that's uh, really enough to see it through into a coalition with Angela Merkel remains to be seen. The combination that many Germans would seem to prefer is uh, a return to the grand coalition uh, with the Social Democrats and uh, Pierre Steinbrück is the leader of that party, uh, which was the first coalition that Angela Merkel led and she would be probably comfortable doing that again, although uh, there are those who, who worry about grand coalitions cause, because it, it tends to encourage the extremes in Germany if you want to oppose that grand coalition it pushes voters to the extreme. So is there no possibility of another Chancellor other than Angela Merkel? There is one way that Mr Steinbrück could uh, manage to lead a government and that would be in coalition with uh, both the Greens and the Left Party which, uh, which consists of many former communists from e Eastern Germany. Uh, that's something he's ruled out but many in his party are, are, are tempted by. One of the most interesting things I think to watch out for is whether a newcomer on the scene, the, the alternative for Germany, uh, manages to get about that 5% of the vote threshold. And it is the only party really which is making a different uh, noise on Europe. It wants to, um, it's anti-bailout, it thinks that's bad news for German taxpayers. It wants to set ways for troubled southern European countries to leave the euro because it thinks it's not sustainable with them inside it. So there's plenty to watch out for even though at the end of the day in all probability Angela Merkel will remain Chancellor of Germany. Tom, it's that time of year when world leaders gather at, in New York at the United Nations General Assembly and one of uh, the most interesting pairings to watch is that of Barack Obama and Hassan Rouhani, the new president of Iran. Are, are they going to meet and what might they say? It looks as though they may meet. There's no formal meeting on the agenda, but it looks as though they might try to have a chat on the sidelines of this assembly. Uh, that might sound like a small thing, but it could turn out to be quite an important meeting. The last time an American president met a senior member of Iran's government was before the revolution in 1979. This week we saw a series of measures which seemed designed to show uh, Iran in a slightly friendlier light. Uh, first of all, the government released 11 political prisoners. Um, after that, we saw this interesting exchange of letters between Hassan Rouhani and Barack Obama um, and it got stranger he then tweeted Happy New Year to Jews around the world which is something of a change from his predecessor Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and after that the government unblocked temporarily sites like Twitter and Facebook so all this seemed to be part of a, a sort of charm offensive by the government. Well that's all very well but the big issue is clearly the nuclear one another of Barack Obama's red lines as uh, the use of uh, chemical weapons in Syria has been. Is there really scope for uh, some sort of compromise or agreement there? Well, it looks as though there could be. Again, this week we saw some movement there when the president transferred control of the nuclear issue from the National Security Council to the Foreign Ministry, which is thought to be slightly more dovish on these things. 
And people hope that the sanctions that are in place on Iran are actually helping to change the government's attitude. The economy in Iran is really creaking under the strain of these sanctions. But there is another view as well. Many people, especially in Israel, are concerned that this just represents a change in tactics by the government of Iran and that these negotiations are more of a stalling tactic than anything else. Um, coupled with America's inaction on Syria, there are many people who worry that Barack Obama is going rather easy on his enemies in the Middle East uh, and that he ought to take a stricter line. Now, at the same meeting in New York next week, uh, various world leaders are going to be discussing their successes to the Millennium Development Goals. Can you tell us a bit about what these new goals will be? Well, yes, well, first of all, uh, the Millennium Development Goals were, as the name suggests, goals that were uh, set at the turn of the century to run for 15 years, and they were on uh, reducing extreme pod poverty, improving health, improving the lot of women, and, and so on, eight goals in total. Uh, but they run out uh, after 15 years. That was the time frame given, and that was the point, in a sense, to set a deadline for achieving various things. Uh, so the question arises, what do you do to replace them? And the idea that uh, the UN and others have hit upon is to have sustainable development goals. And next week, uh, on September the 25th, uh, at a meeting, uh, there will be a sort of rundown towards set trying to find a roadmap, essentially, uh, for fixing new goals called Sustainable Development Goals uh, by 2015, which will succeed the Millennium Development Goals. And the question will be, of course, what will go into them? And what will go into them? <laughs> well, Sustainable Development Goals, as you can tell from the name, is a very broad uh, concept. And I think there are really two questions here. One is, um, do these goals do any good in the first place? There are those who say, well, you can set the goals, but it's actually um, the broad policies that uh, governments adopt that, that matter much more. And if you are to have a goal, the one that really matters is reducing extreme uh, poverty. And from that, uh, all the other things follow. If you achieve uh, that uh, aim of, of bringing the very poorest up, then um, all sorts of other good things, including environmental things, would start to happen. Others say, no, 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 you have to have specific goals on things like uh, a low carbon economy, biodiversity and the like. Uh, and there is a, a possibility that uh, everything will be thrown into this. And so the job of, of, of this, uh, the people working on this is to try and come up with something that is manageable, specific, uh, and not just a, a big wish list. Uh, but they'll have uh, some time to go over it. This is just really the starting gun. Finally, Tom, to Amsterdam. And as you said at the outset, a new Van Gogh goes on display. How can, how can such a thing be new when, of course, uh, the artist is dead? Well, he hasn't painted any new ones for a while, as you say, but it's new in the sense that previously nobody knew that it was an original Van Gogh. Um, it was painted in 1888, uh, and it was originally bought by a Norwegian businessman. Um, he then got a visit from the French ambassador to Sweden, who pointed out that, it, in his opinion, it was a fake. Uh, and so this poor guy hid it away in his attic, rather embarrassed that he thought he'd uh, been conned. Um, it now seems, though, that it's the real thing. Uh, the, the Norwegian businessman died in 1970, and the painting was then transferred to a mystery buyer. We don't know who owns it now. But whoever they are, they took it to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, and the experts there uh, verified that it is indeed a genuine painting. So what makes them think that it was genuine? Why was their, their view different from the earlier experts, so-called, who called it a fake? Well, they themselves had a look at it actually uh, 20 years ago or more, and back then they weren't sure. But what's changed since then is that the experts now have access to a collection of letters by Vincent van Gogh. And among them is a letter that he wrote to his brother the day after he did this painting back in July 1888. And he says in this letter in characteristic Van Gogh style, you know, I did this painting, it's a load of rubbish, I'm not very happy with it. Um, but because of that, they were able to identify exactly where he was, the subject of the painting and so on. Um, and combined with traditional techniques like um, checking the chemical structure of the paint and x-raying the canvas and that type of thing, they were able to confirm that it was done using the materials that he was using at that point in his career, the same paints, the same canvas and so on. Um, so they're fairly confident now that it's the real thing and far from being a fake, it's probably worth tens of millions of dollars. Well, that's our authentic take on the week ahead. If you have any comments or feedback, please visit our news blog at economist.com slash blogs slash newsbook and join us again next week for another look at the week ahead. From London, this is The Economist.